time with you. So we get a chance to look at Comcast, a company that I always think of as a cable company, Xfinity, et cetera. It's been around for a long time, but boy, they have sure created a lot more revenue opportunities, a lot different, a lot more different types of business that we're kind of interested in as we look at that today. Well, for those of you who are new, uh, thank you for joining us. A couple of things we just want to make sure tools-wise. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Uh, and let's make sure that chat box is open. As Bailey described, that will be one of our key ways in which we can kind of communicate uh, around um, our business and financial acumen in, in, in information today. So let's go ahead and open that chat box. Make sure it's nice and uh, has it open and make sure it's set to everyone. That way, when you respond, everybody can kind of see your comments there. But here's the question I wanted to ask just to make sure you're comfortable. For those who have been with us before, it's a little bit about where are you calling in from? Well, it could be a city, could be a state, could be a country. Just put in the chat box. Where are you calling in from at, at this time? It'll help us to kind of get a feel for who's on the call. Uh, myself, Bailey, and our colleagues. Well, actually, Bailey's down in Texas. We're here uh, just south of Salt Lake City. Our corporate offices are in Salt, uh, just south of Salt Lake City a little bit, uh, where we're, our claim to fame is we had the chance to host the Winter Olympics. Uh, so we, we love snow. We love having people come and ski on our mountains. So please come out. <laughs> uh, Salt Lake City, Utah is where we're located. In fact, I think today, uh, I don't know if my colleagues are aware of this, I think today we're finding out whether or not we get the 2034 Olympics again. We're trying to we're trying to get it to come back again uh, 30 plus years later. Anyways, uh, looking forward to spending some time. Looks like the chat box is working. Everybody's comfortable. As Bailey described, that will be the best way for us to interact and communicate uh, as we get going today. Um, let's a second tool that we'll be using is polling. So let me just open the poll and make sure it's working on your side. I tested this morning. You should have in front of you a question. Um, you know, basically it's in regards to when's, have you had a chance to participate in this webinar before you should see that on your screen? Yes. Uh, this is my first time. No, I've attended it before, uh, et cetera. So just get a feel for those that are with us. Now, for those that are new, we do these every single month as for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's an add-on. It's, it's a continued learning experience. You can't learn business and financial acumen by just going to one course. So how can I take these tools and continue to apply them to be, continue to build my understanding of business? So there's some of these tools that we use in the co corporate uh, in, our, in our corporate training programs is included in the tool that you can continue to come back to various companies. So every month we do a different company a different industry as we try and kind of have a breadth of experience. But it's a great way to, for those that have gone through our programs to come back and, and actually continue to build your business and financial acumen. Other people that might be interested, you may just be interested in individually learning more about business and how do I kind of transition from a functional expert to a business expert who also has functional expertise. How can I how can I move from just my silo? I'm a good finance person, a good accountant, I'm a good uh, HR operations person. How do I kind of see that bigger picture of our organization, and then help us make better big business decisions? So we do these every month for anybody. You don't have to have gone through our program as a way to continue to build your capability to understand what is communicated in an earnings call. Why is it important? How can I use it? Whether I'm an investor, whether I'm an employee, or maybe I'm a sales individual and I want to sell into a corporation. I, if you're in sales, I can't think of a better thing to do. If you're selling to a publicly traded company, then every quarter, do a quick review of what they're talking about. It puts you in a much stronger position to become that trusted partner. Imagine you sit down with the person you're selling into, and you can actually articulate how your products or services will drive towards their company strategy, their company execution, their key metrics, et cetera. You're basically helping them make that business case internally. So folks, this is a great way. I kind of, I kind of call these earnings calls a hidden, hidden gem. These are available for everybody, but not everybody listens to them. Not everybody engages around. So my hope today is to inspire you enough to say, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to take the next two or three quarters, use the tool that we walked through today, uh, if you're brand new, if, if you've been part of our program, I'm going to make sure I reuse the tools that I've been given for the next two or three quarters. And I've been doing this for about 13 years. And my my one of the best things, if you've ever been in one of my programs, some of you may, some of you not, or you've been with one of my colleagues, one of the biggest things that will move the needle around this is to do this for the next two or three quarters. If you take these tools and you get, especially if you're publicly traded, if you're selling in a publicly traded but even if you're just trying to build your understanding of business, sometimes people look back, well, why would I do that? It's an hour out of my time a month or something like that. Well, here's the value. The more you do that, the more comfortable you are. As you start to hear your executive team, whether they're publicly traded or not, throughout key metrics like 
like free cash flow or DSO, day sells outstanding, or uh, uh, earnings per share uh, if they're publicly traded. You begin to understand what they're really talking about. And then with your functional expertise, help us make better business decisions. So highly recommend, appreciate for those that join. It looks like I got the poll done. Let's see what the results are. You should see that on your screen. Looks like 70%. It's your first time. Well, hey, thank you. I, I really recommend the next, come back two more times and, and it'll really help you. If you're publicly traded, really engage with what your company is providing. Every company uh, has this information. I'll show you how to access it here in just a moment. Well, it looks like those tools are working great. Let me go ahead and jump in. As we've got, uh, we cover a lot of information. If you've been on these calls before, you'll 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 remember that. But let me go ahead and jump to our slide deck and let's jump into what we're going to do today. So uh, uh, we're talking about Comcast. Last month, every month we do a different company, a different industry. Next month, we're doing Warner Brothers. Uh, we've done oil and gas industry. We've done healthcare industry, consumer products, uh, uh, online. Uh, you know, we've done Amazon. We've done various groups over the years. But every month we do a different industry to kind of give you a little feel for how different industries might look at uh, their business and financial performance. Mm -hmm. Well, so you come to a program called How to Listen to an Earnings Call. You may have been voluntold to come, so thank you for joining us. But but uh, my question to you, you're here. When was the last time you listened to an earnings call? As we think about this topic of business and financial acumen, let me get my poll questions back up. I went to screen share and I lost some of my things here. Uh, so when's the last time you listened to a company earnings call? Now, this could be your own company. It could be a company that uh, you used to work with, maybe a company you invest in. Uh, again, that sales connection. I sell into a company, but I, I, I take that time every month to really understand every quarter to really understand my customer. I'm just an individual investor. I, I think about a lot of times in my classes, people will talk about, hey, Brent, you got any investment strategies? And I always do, do my disclaimer. Don't use any of the information I've given you in this course to plan your portfolio. I'm not, a, I'm not a financial planner, et cetera. But one of the things that I've really found really differentiates people is the more you understand about business. This is Warren Buffett, right? Warren Buffett's ideas around investment. Can I see an economic model? Can I see in their metrics and measures and their strategy? Uh, for, uh, positive cash generation, um, uh, various metrics that he looks at. The more you understand about business, the better you are as an investor. And 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 being able to understand the business fundamentals really differentiates. So it's, it's not just for your current company. It's not just for a company you might sell into or work for in the future, but it also can help you as you think about your financial goals and what you're trying to accomplish as a business. So as I look at this um, uh, poll here, it looks like uh, this year, so about 46% of, of you have listened to one this year, last year. Many of you, it's been a while. Again, my hope today is to inspire you to say, you know what? I'm going to take this time. The next two or three quarters, I'm going to try and listen to this or engage with this for the next three months. I'm going to listen to uh, Warner, Warner Brothers. I'm going to use this tool. Come back to our call next month and let's walk through it together. Get comfortable about using the tools. Absolutely will differentiate you. We think about large corporations. Why do these do these earnings calls? What's the purpose? What's the value, et cetera? We think about a company the size of, of uh, Comcast. There's, there's, there's some challenges that CEOs face in large organizations. Let me give you some of those stats. Here's a stat you may or may not be familiar with. If you've been in our program, you probably remember this stat. 95% of employees don't understand company strength. Strategy. Now think about that. You got a company like Comcast with 185,000, I think is the number, employees, and 95% of them don't understand your strategy. That could be a challenge. Now, I'm not saying that's their number. This was a Harvard business study, multiple companies, tens of thousands of employees. But think about that. If, if we are a group of, you know, 25 of us and we are working together, we could talk very regularly about what every Friday we can meet together and say, hey, here's what we're working on. Here's the challenges. What are you doing? What am I doing? But now you're in tens of thousands of employees. How do you get everybody seeing the big picture? What are you trying to accomplish? And then with their functional expertise, make good decisions. Well, here's another stat. 90% of employees don't understand companies' important business metrics. When I think about when people think business or financial acumen, many of us think we go directly to the financial statements. If you come to one of our programs, you do our online training, what you'll find is business acumen is much more. When I think of financial statements, I think of a scoreboard. So go into your favorite sporting event. You go into that sporting event and you're late. You're at the very end. It's all you come to your son, daughter, granddaughter, or maybe it's a professional sport. You, you get there late, right? You see the score. You can see who kind of won or lost, but you don't really know what's behind the numbers. It's really all, all the financials doing is are we getting better or are we getting worse? The real ability is to say, okay, what is our strategy? Can I see in the numbers whether or not 
our strategic objectives, the actions that we're playing towards are really driving towards those roles or not. And then be able to say, okay, well, based upon performance, what's the next step of what I need to do? Well, if this is really true that 90% of employees don't understand key metrics and measures, how can we really assess the performance? Well, every quarter these executives get online, they talk about their strategy. They talk about their key metrics and measures. They even forecast to the market. Here's what I expect to generate in cash flow. Here's what I expect to generate in profitability. Here's our growth strategy. Here's, here's acquisition opportunities. They really speak to what they're trying to do. And your ability to take tools and be able to quickly assess what are they talking about, what's their strategic objectives, how are they performing, get the scoreboard, and then most importantly, what can I do about it? That's the real goal of these calls, and I think that's what executives want us to do. So you imagine your large corporate corporation like Comcast, uh, 186. I was off by a thousand employees, 186 thousand employees. Well, I always think of them because growing up, I mean, Comcast, uh, Xfinity were always kind of a cable company to me. But they're not just cable. <laughs> they they have cable, they have fiber, so the connectivity, internet connection, that type. But media. Uh, studios, you know, Oppenheimer was produced by Comcast, the, the, the famous movie, that you, the theme parks that they have. I mean, they've got a lot of Sky, if you're in the UK, you know, uh, the uh, very well-known kind of media giant Sky, they own Sky. It, and they actually are 33% owner in Hulu, if you're familiar with that. They're not just an internet connect, the, the company I grew up on. They, they, they are this media giant, uh, to be quite honest with you. In, in over 30 countries, some of the key big country places they, they play. UK, obviously, with Sky, Japan, China, Italy, Germany. Those are some of the key areas. Uh, of course, the United States. 121 000, uh, billion, <laughs> 121 billion, 427,000, uh, excuse me, million uh, dollars in revenue last year. They are a significant player in, 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 in uh, the global space. In fact, I, I didn't have them on there, but they wireless. <laughs> they do. They, do uh, they compete with uh, Verizon, or actually, Verizon's a partner, but they have a service for cell phones as well. <laughs> Anyways, big player. So imagine you see a Brian Roberts. <laughs> what is it? What is it you want? Is you think about trying to get the big picture, get people to execute. What do I want to communicate? Well, what is it you need your customers to know about your business? What is it you need your employees to know? What about the shareholders? Obviously, it's a publicly traded company. What is it I want my shareholders to know about our strategy, about our financial performance, where we're headed? Uh, and, and finally, what about all the partners that they work with? Internal, external partners. How do we get everybody on the same page to get high execution? Well, that's what these earnings calls are about. It's a chance for them to communicate both the strategic focus of the business, a little bit of review on the financial performance, but a real goal of, so where do we go from here? Think of it in our personal life. Where am I currently at? How did I, how am I doing and where do I want to go? How am I going to get there? That's what these calls are all about. It's a great way for any individual to get that big picture. And if I'm working for Comcast, you see what they're talking about and then say, okay, based upon what Mr. Roberts is communicating, what can I do as a finance leader? What can I do as an operation leader? How do I align my goals and objectives and make a large 186,000 employee feel like I'm connected and I can really make a difference? Well, that's what they're trying to do. And not only is it valuable from the standpoint of understanding business, but I love this stat from Gallup. Every year, Gallup does an assessment on engagement. Some of you may be familiar with this. This is 2022 numbers, and it's specifically for the United States. I know some of you are outside, uh, and they do them for other countries as well. But this is tens of thousands of employees, and they suggest that 68% of employees are either disengaged or actively disengaged. So coming back, why should I do this? Brent's trying to make the case. Here's another reason. Not only understand that 95% of employees don't understand key uh, strategic objectives, 90% don't understand the key metrics, but now look at this statistic. 68% of employees are either disengaged or actually disengaged. How do I change that? If you're a leader, this stat comes from Corporate Leadership Council. It suggests that, that as you think about engaging your employees, the top two things I think have a, a significant alignment with why you might want to listen to these calls. If an employee can make a connection between the work they do and what the strategy, the, I can see how I fit within the strategic objective, you're going to get increased engagement. The second one is if they can see why their value to that country, how their job uh, is the importance of their job in organizational success. You may remember, recall years ago, there's a story of, um, I think it was JFK went to NASA when it, the big thing, let's get to the moon in, next, in 10 years, et cetera. 
And I, I, as the story goes, as I remember, he, he interacts, I think I want to say janitor within the organization. He says, what do you do here? And he says, I help people get on the moon. That ability for employees to see that my role, uh, I, I, I'm in a, a janitorial role, which is important, yet the bigger picture of how this helps us to be successful, it, 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 that's what these Calls can do for you. The more you get aligned with what the organization is trying to do and then help your employees understand, you're going to get that increased engagement. So why do it? Help people understand. Let's overcome that 95% of employees don't listen to uh, uh, understand strategic objectives. 90% of employees don't understand my metrics. And let's increase engagement. My guarantee, I've been doing this for a lot of years. The tool I'm going to give you at the end of today, and by the way, if you're in our courses, you'll see these tools are very sim similar. It's just packaged in how to use it in, uh, uh, listening to an earnings call. Uh, the biggest thing that I find, I guarantee you, in the next, if you do this two to three quarters consecutive, you will build your credibility. People will recognize you seem to know more about what's going on in this business. You'll build your career as well as you'll help build the company, especially if you're publicly traded. How do I align? How do I connect? How do I execute? Well, um, let's jump into it. Let me walk through. I'm going to walk you through how to get engaged and, and, and how to use this tool. So let's start by just introducing. A pro I'm going to give you a process. I'm going to give you a five driver framework. And I'm going to give you two tools. That's what we're going to do in the remaining 45 minutes or so that we have left today. So let's start with the process, three step process. You got to prepare for these calls. You got to analyze and you got to do something. You got to apply them. So let's talk about the prepare phase. Don't worry about taking a bunch of notes. This is the tool at the end. You'll see it. We'll give it to you. I just don't want to give it to you now and you're thumbing through it. We'll get it to the very end. Okay. So here we go. First of all, the basics. Let me give you a quick overview of these calls. If you haven't ever listened to them, it's been a while. They're basically broke up into two parts. The first part is the prepared remarks. This is where your senior leaders get on a call and they communicate kind of where we've been, how did we perform, and where do we want to go as a company. And, and uh, they, they, they're not required to do these calls. Every quarter, they are required to submit their financial performance if you're publicly traded. But these calls, is that they're doing this specifically because they want to give their pitch. They want to be able to give their, their, their perspective about why they did what they did and where they're going, et cetera. They want to give that full information so investors can make better decisions about what they're doing. So employees can see, well, what's going on and how can I impact that? Well, that typically usually is about on a short end would be like a 15-minute uh, conversation. But a lot of them are usually about a half hour. Then they shift, they make a switch, and then you get a Q&A. Now, for most companies, it's not a Q&A like we'll have at the end of this meeting. If you have any questions, we just open it up. This is literally, you've got analysts of large financial institutions, well, Far well, Wells Fargo's, Bar Barclays, uh, Fidelity, these big financial institutions, they have a chance to ask clarifying question. So you got analysts asking the executives, well, you say this, about your profitability. Well, can you give me a little bit more color on what you expect those numbers to be? Uh, they're trying to get more data because in the end, they're going to make a report to their investors and say, you either need to, well, there's five of them, but the basics one I typically think of, buy, hold, or sell. Uh, there's actually different ones in between that, but those are the common ones, right? So they're going to make kind of this recommendation. These happen on a quarterly basis, uh, and, and they're about an hour long as you look at that. So with that brief overview, what do I need to do to pre prepare? There's kind of three things. First, you've got to locate the call or the transcript. For those of you who've been with me before, I'll show you how to do this. The easiest way is to jump to Google, and you're just going to use Google. Just type in, and, and you already see it's there, Comcast. Uh, investor relation, I could say. I could say quarterly communication, but... I, it's investor relations coming up. So I'm going to hit that one. There I go. So you're going to go there. Now you're going to see, actually, you're going to see different kind of third party groups trying to make it NASDAQ, Barron's, Yahoo, et cetera. But I always want to go to the company itself. Now you can actually go to their website. You can navigate to investors and get to it. But I come here, I can jump right to it, but I see right here, events and presentation. I know enough about it or financials. Any one of those is going to get me to earnings. It's going to get me to kind of their quarterly results. I'll just pick the first one, events and presentations. So I come in here and every company has it. Now, again, you could go to Comcast, then you can go to investors, then you could kind of find this. I just type in court, what quarter I'm interested in and it jumps to me there. So you see, they did, they did a presentation on the 16th this month, Morgan Stanley Europe, and you can actually get a transcript as well as listen to that call. But here's the most recent call. So here it is right here. Now, if it's prior to the call, you'd actually have a link where you could go in and register. Now, their call happened on 
uh, uh, October 26th. And they don't have their uh, full year one, which will be end of um, January. They don't have the invite yet, right? If they had the invite, you'd come in, you click on it, you, you register, and it gives you access to it. But because the calls already happen, it happened back on the 26th of October, they're going to have all that information available to you. So again, if it's before the call, you just register. Just like you registered for our webinar, you do a similar type of registration, and they'll actually often give you a link you can put on your calendar, and you're ready to go. How to log in and get ready for that call. Usually within 24 hours of the call happening, though, they actually give you access to a, a recorded version. Now, right here, I could type in and, and put my name in it, and it gives me access to it, and it'll automatically jump to it. I don't have time to do that, but because it's already happened, it would do it. Now, if this was pre-call, this would be my registration. I would submit it, and then once the call was done, I wouldn't have to do the re uh, registration here. Okay, But I've got the actual call. You can listen to the call right off their website. After it's already happened, and it, you know, what are we, the, what's the date? The 29th. So over a month later, I can jump on and re-listen to what they're doing. Uh, they also have a transcript. Now, not everybody does this, but I love getting the transcript. This is word for word what they communicated. Who was on the call? So here you go. You got your CEO right there. You got, uh, maybe jump to him where he's at. Our, we got our CEO. We got... Um, uh, the two that did the most talking was Michael Kavanaugh, their president, and then Jason Armstrong, their CFO. They did the majority of the pre prepared remarks, and then everybody else joined in on that. Not only did they, you have who was representing the corporate participants, but we also have all the analysts who were on the call as well. This is word for word. You go listen to that call. You open this up. The operator is going to say, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Comcast Third Quarter. It's word for word. Now, if the company doesn't have it, there's a bunch of third parts. All, you, all I do is do Q3 2023 uh, Comcast earnings call transcript. And it'll take me to like Motley Fool. It'll take me to um, uh, Seeking Alpha. And they, they will do it as well. So if a company doesn't have it available you usually within 24 hours can get access to a transcript. I love the transcript because I can read faster than listen and it all allows me to mark it up. But either way, you can get access to it once it happens. Now, for some companies, I love the companies who have these uh, uh, slide decks. The slide deck is a great way to get a basic understanding of what's going on in the company. It's a highlight of what they present in the call. So here's the highlights for Q3. What happened from revenue, EBITDA, their key metrics. What are their growth objectives? What happened from a growth perspective? These are really great to be, get a basic understanding of what's going on. A lot of times we do these earnings call debriefs with our clients where we're literally looking at their company. Like if Comcast was my client, I would do a deeper dive than we're going to be able to do today, but I'd weave in all their slides. And so for the learner, it's like, okay, I can listen to what they talk, but Brent's going to walk me through. We're going to look at this together. What did I see? What did you see? It's a great way for them to continue to build their business of financial acumen. But these slide decks really give a, a richness of the experience, and you can learn a lot just by looking at the slide decks. So not all of them have them. You can always access the call itself pre and then listen to it. You can also do it post and usually you got an audio copy and you can download a transcript uh, uh, either from their site or one of the third party sites. So that's how you locate the call and transcript. Pretty simple there. Then the second thing is review your notes. And some of you say, well, Brent, what do you mean review your notes? This is my first time doing it. Well, you're not going to have a bunch of notes if it's the first time you've done it. But remember, I can also go back to where they were and I can look at Earlier in the year, here's their Q2 call. So if I was saying, hey, I want to get ready for Q3, it has, well, right now you're going to do Q3. I can listen to that, do it on my own, and then get ready for the call. So even if you don't have notes, if you want to do a quick preparation, quick review of what did they say last quarter, a lot of times they have a little summary, their press review. There's a number of ways you can get to that. Once you've done this at least one quarter, then the next quarter, all you do is open the tool you have, review what you communicated there. The last part of it is to meet with your team. Now, some say, well, what is? why would you do that? It's a great way. If I, if, if I was a leader of a company that was publicly traded, I would bring my team together. I'd do this with them. It's not just about building my business segment, but think about it. If your employees understand the business as well as you do. And, and are continually trying to be, at least on a quarterly basis, attentive to what we're talking about. And then being able to come back and say, well, what can we do as a team? That's a huge differentiator from an execution, long-term sustainability of your role. So doing it with a team is great. Now, you might say, well, Brent, I'm an individual contributor. Well, do it with a colleague. Do it with a, you know, somebody within your team. It's a great way for you to just kind of bounce ideas. Here's what I heard. Did you hear the same thing, et cetera?
So folks, that's the prepare phase. You got to locate either pre-call or after the calls happen. You got to kind of prep, do a quick review of what they said last time. That's a great way to say, okay, well, this is what they said. Let me see what now what they say. And then uh, get your team together to kind of do that. The analysis phase. That's by far the biggest portion of both our call today, but it's also the biggest part of the of what you're going to do as you kind of assess these companies. So let me start by um, just walking you through a simple framework. These are five fundamental drivers everybody, every company focus on. Whether you're a $121 billion Comcast or you're a small privately held company, you know, a little street vendor or something like that. These are the fundamental drivers every company focuses on. So for those that have been in our classes, open your chat box and let's just walk through this. I'm looking like a three minute review of this model here. So we talk about cash, the importance of cash, fill in the blank for me. Cash is blank. Put it in the chat box. What's the importance of cash in any company, whether you're 121 billion, uh, whether you're a small, uh, privately held mom and pop shop, yeah, cash is king. It's royalty. Liqui liquidity is another name for it. It's the lifeblood of a business. Ron Strom says it's the oxygen of a business. Thank you, Martha. Absolutely. It's vitally important. And you look at how much they generated. At the, uh, at three months into this year, they've generated almost $21 billion of cash flow. If you've been through our classes, you'll remember cash flow is the difference between all the cash that comes in from their core businesses. Minus all the cash that went out to run. So this is minus all of your operating expenses, their labor costs, all their operating expenses. It's kind of what cash is left over. Imagine you run your whole business. At the end of the uh, three months, you have $21 billion available to do something with, to reinvest in your company, to strengthen your financial position by paying down debt, to getting money back to shareholders. I mean, that's a huge amount. Uh, they're, they're forecasting to be just under $30 billion of free cash flow, guys. They generate a lot of cash. Cash is vitally important. There's levers as to things you can do to impact it. Some of them you might be familiar with. Grow your revenue, reduce your cost, collect faster on your receivables or DSO, how quickly a company turns its inventory, um, how, how, how we try and delay payments, slow down your payments. All these things will strengthen your cash position. If you want to see what's going on from a cash perspective, the cash flow statement will tell you what a company is doing around their cash. Now, profit. Uh, this is probably the driver by far that gets most time and attention. When you listen to these calls, they talk a lot about profitability, what's happened from a revenue perspective, what's happened from a cost perspective, how much EBITDA, gross profit, operating profit, net profit are regenerating. Of course, the statement you're going to look at is called the income statement. But just by way of reminder, as you think about this driver of profit, I want to just kind of highlight the two fundamental levers every person has to impact profitability. I can increase one part of the business one metric or measure. I can also decrease the other. I can increase or decrease, increase here, decrease here, and it generates more profitability. For those that have been in the program, what are some of the key, um, what can I increase? What can I decrease to grow my profitability? If Comcast wants to generate more profit, what do they have to do? Increase, help me out here, price or volume, so sales, revenue. So increase price or volume will grow my revenue or sales, right? If I can charge a higher price, or sell more of it, that's going to generate more revenue, more sales is another term. Sometimes it's just referred to as the top line, vitally important. The second part is to reduce margins, which Otis is talking about increasing margin, right? Well, increasing margin, how do I do that? I can increase my pricing and or reduce my cost, and that will increase my profitability. Fundamentally, there's different types of profit. You've got gross profit, where you just take out the direct cost of your products or service. Operating profits. Let's look at our core business. How much profit does our core business generate? And then net profit. Bottom line is a corporation. How much do we generate? Another, some of the acronyms you might remember, for example, operating profit, also known as EBIT. EBIT. So increase revenue or also known as sales, reduce my cost or expenses. Those are the levers we have to impact profitability. If you want to see what's going on with the company's profit, you look right there. Their income statement is where you'll see that. Assets, anything you own or control, which has value in the chat box. What are some of the things that Comcast owns or control, which has value? Which for me was insightful going through this. I haven't looked at them for years. I used to work with Verizon Communication, would look at them, uh, Comcast. Uh, but um, man, what they do today, what do they own or control, which has value? As you think about a Comcast, yeah, absolutely. Property, buildings, network, yes. Theme parks, yes, Shiraz. That was interesting to me. I, I knew they did, but I, I, it's, it's amazing what they're doing. They're Harry Potter. No, it's not Harry Potter. They've got a, um, 
I say like Nintendo or something, a new rollout at one of their sites. Yeah, intellectual property, Brian. Absolutely. They have cash. Um, they, they have contractual, you know, they have the contract for here in the United States, the Super Bowl. Uh, it's going to be streamed on Peacock. The Super Bowl, they have the rights to stream that. Think about that. I mean, that's that's a pretty good thing to have the contract for that, right? Of course, they have customers, all these different things. Assets, anything I own or control, which has value. Uh, you have what they call asset strength. How financially strong? Can you withstand the ups and downs of a marketplace versus utilization? How much do I strengthen my financial position to withstand the ups and downs versus how much do I deploy to, to utilize those assets to grow my business? That's a constant battle companies are focused on. Of course, if you want to know what's going on there, you can look at the balance sheet. Of course, growth is what investors expect, right? Every every investor wants to see growth, but not only do investors expect it. Typically, your leaders are motivated. They're, they're driven by it. Their compensation is driven by that. Employees love growth, right? We want to be in a growing company. And of course, customers want to be part of a company that really has the right products or right services uh, to invest my dollars uh, 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 as a as an individual. Of course, people, the core of any business is people. We're talking about both those that buy or use your products or services, so all their external customers, but also internally. How do you get 186,000 people coming together and get great execution? Well, that's the five-driver model in a nutshell. So how do I use that to, as I'm listening to a call, how can I use the five drivers to assess both the strategic focus and the financial performance? Well, that's where the two tools come in. The first tool is called the executive alignment tool. And if you've been in my class, if you've been in any of our uh, business acumen classes, you'll be familiar with this tool. But for those that aren't, let me give you a high level what it is. It's called the executive alignment tool. It's just using that simple five driver framework as, as a mental model to assess what's being communicated. Now, if I'm listening to the call, I just sit there and listen. I Get a piece of paper out. I write cash, profit, asset, growth, and people on the paper. Every time they say something about cash, I put a little slash mark. I could do it up here, down here. Profitability, I put little slash marks, right? I just start marking that up. Now, if I actually have the transcript, I like it that way. It's a lot easier. I just mark it right on the transcript. Okay, they're talking cash here, profit, et cetera. Well, all, if you think about that, instead of just trying to listen to everything and try to make sense of it, if I just have fundamentally, which of the five drivers do they seem to focus on? Go through that process, and then you answer four simple questions. They're on the second page of this document. The first one, which driver seems to get the most attention? I love the second part of it. And why? What's going on in their business? What's the challenges they're facing? What's the goals and objectives going forward? Um, who are they talking to as a why, for example? Well, what were the two or three main points the executive was trying to make? What were their goals and objectives going forward? And this is the most important as you think about what key questions are the analysts, where's the, that differentiator? What are they kind of challenging us about? Then from there, say, so what can I do about it? Based upon what I've listened, what can I and my team do to drive towards those key uh, uh, objectives or goals to be able to understand the key points and be able to drive towards these key uh, drivers that they talk about? So that's how it works. Now, some of you might say, well, Brent, wait a second here. I haven't taken your class. This is going to be kind of difficult. Well, don't worry. Uh, my 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 uh, instructional design team have put it together, a, a real quick definition of what do we mean by cash, kind of breaking into the two kind of cash areas that most companies focus on, kind of their cash position, as well as their cash flow. The other thing I really like about the tool is it gives you these, I call them trigger words, simple phrases. If I hear them talk about dividends or distributions, I mean, they're going to mark cash. I might, all, I might also talk about people as well, right? Because dividends is cash giving back to their investors. Well, that's cash. It takes cash to do that, but also it motivates investors. So I might do cash and people if they talk dividends. But anyways, you can see just different terms, stock buybacks, debt, issue. If I hear any of those, those are automatic cashes for me. Versus down here, sales, revenue, pricing, that's all going to be profitability. So in the end, you don't have to have an expertise. All you have to do is listen and kind of capture this information and use the tool. That's the tool, folks. So here's what I want to do. In the next 25 minutes, I want to just quickly take three minutes. And let's walk through just a few of the quotes that were from the most recent call. Let's see if we can do that. Open your chat box. And here's my first question as we get going here. Now, actually, their president, uh, Brian Roberts, he didn't he didn't have any of the prepared remarks. Instead, he turned it over to Mike uh, uh, Michael Kavanaugh. I don't know if it goes by Michael or Mike. Mr. Kavanaugh and Mr. Armstrong, who walked through their prepared remarks. So let's start with Mr. Kavanaugh, their president of Comcast. And let's see what he said. So here I've got on the screen. I'm going to read it. 
all I want you to do in the chat box is tell me, you got the five drivers, which of the five drivers does he seem to be focused on as we read this, this first part here? Our broadband network, one of their portions of their business, uh, pro and product leadership continue to drive strong residential revenue growth. Right there should trigger at least one, possibly two uh, drivers there, which was up nearly 4% this quarter, fueled by very strong ARPU, aver average revenue per user, it's a metric, uh, growth of about 3.9%. What drivers did you see in there? Oh, great. People are already marking it up. Yes, definitely. When I hear revenue, revenue, although revenue, if you collect it, eventually becomes um, cash, I always think profitability, revenue. Um, they're talking about our average revenue per uh, a user, right? These are all kind of profit and growth for sure. Eventually, it's going to flow through to be cash as well. Excellent. Well, let's go to the next sentence here. We're confident in our ability to drive continued ARPU, average rev revenue per user, growth. Boy, when it says the word, that's an easy one for us, right? Uh, because of our focus on constantly improving the product experience. What is a product experience? Experience through investment and product experience. So product, what products I offer, but the experience my customers are having. Could So not only does it say it, but you can kind of take that and say, well, yeah, he's talking both about the products he offers, which could be assets, but also the experience people are having with it. Uh, and through investments and innovation, thus delivering more value to our customers, a people driver. Excellent. Yes, you're getting assets, you're getting people and growth again. Having a truly excellent internet experience, one of their assets, as reflected in speed, reliability, coverage, security, and latency, is constantly increasing in importance to all households, which driver there, as a result of customer experience experiences it enables. We none of us like our our cable <laughs> dying on us, right? Yes, people there, products I'm offering could be an asset, right? Could be growth as well. One of the biggest catalysts for recent growth in data usage is the acceleration transition of sports viewership. <laughs> now remember, I said they got the Super Bowl. They also have some of the um, uh, international football or, or U.S. We call it soccer. Uh, they have some of those contracts. Um, those contracts really differentiate them and sets them apart. And they, they talked about is uh, they got the contract on Thursday night football. I think it was, if I remember correctly, 25% of their usage on their network is people watching that football game. It's, it's in, here in the United States. So it's pretty incredible what they're doing. But yes, you got growth, you got people, you got assets. Okay, let me give you another one. So here's their CFO. I'm going to be quiet. You just kind of scan through it. I'm not the necessary area. Just, let's just throw, what, what is their CFO talking about? Put in the chat box. Which of the five drivers is Mr. Armstrong focusing on? Yeah, there's a little cash there. We're talking profitability for sure. That revenue increase, uh, that's growth. Yeah. EBIT, EBIT does a earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. It's actually a profit measure. So you'll see that. Of course, growth, you see right there. Yeah, you guys see. Now imagine you're listening to the, C, uh, the president. Now you see the CFO and you start to see, are they similarly talking about the same metric, the same uh, drivers or not? And you're seeing some real consistency. We're seeing re replication, maybe a little bit more around uh, uh, some other drivers around cash, for example, but a lot about profitability, a lot about growth, right? You're seeing both of those in the communication. Well, not only do you have your senior executives communicate, but eventually I do this with the analysts. So here's Morgan Stanley, Benjamin Swinburne, I think is how you pronounce it, managing director. And here's what he said. You're going to see stuff around, again, EBITDA, that's profit, growth. Uh, what your expectations are around that, uh, you know, stuff around the iPhone. They're, they're in wireless. They got into wireless. So they're doing cell phones and stuff. So, you know, you're getting productized there, which are assets. Anyways, you can do the same thing on all of these. Well, folks, that is the tool. Now, it's not an exact science. For example, here's what it might look like. If you were to complete it, you might end up with something that looks like this. In the end, you and I will never have the exact same number of slash marks. We do about a thousand plus of these every single year. And in very, it's rare you get people with the exact same slash marks. That being said, in a group of 20 or 25, everybody will have the top two or three in their top two or three. Meaning if, if really um, growth, profit, and assets were the top three, and 23, a group of 24 people, 25 people, everybody's going to have those in the top two or three. 
you'll be maybe not exactly the same. Maybe, maybe you would have profit higher and I'd have growth higher, but it would all be as their top three things. So it's not an exact science. It's not the goal to say, well, hey, you did, how many do you have? How many do I have? It just gives you a simple way to say, okay, well, here's what they're focusing on. So based upon that, how do I go and answer these questions? Which of the five drivers seem to get the most attention and why? What are the two or three main points the executives were trying to make? What goals and trends and objectives going forward? And then what were the analysts kind of challenging them around? Now, a lot of people go to these earnings calls and they just say, you have even leaders say, just listen to the prepared remarks. Now, I would agree. That's very valuable. You get kind of from your executive team what they're trying to pitch. But folks, we don't want to just be, uh, you know, understanding our company. You also want to see what the market's saying. What I love about the analysts is you get a feel, are they aligning? They're agreeing with them? Or are they kind of questioning them? What it really speaks to is what potentially the market's going to say about it. If analysts are kind of saying, you're talking about rapid growth in your company, and yet you're divesting your assets, you're not borrowing to fund growth. I can see it in your numbers. You can see that. I have the executive saying, we're all about growth. But then you look at their numbers, you're saying, well, you're divesting your assets and you're not borrowing to fund growth. Well, how are you growing? Can you help me understand? You say growth, but yet you divested more than you invested and you're not borrowing to help fund that growth. Your financial position is whatever it might be. You start to see where there's congruence or where there's incongruence, which really helps you to get a feel for what's really going on, uh, not just internally, but what external uh, market will see. Well, folks, obviously what I did is I tried to go through it for you here. So uh, we don't have time for us to read and break into groups. That's what we often do <laughs> in, our, in our courses. But for here, what we're just going to do is I'm going to walk you through what I saw. Okay. I went through their call and I kind of highlighted what I saw. Now, again, you may not get the exact same things if you did this and you want to add in the chat box what you saw. So which of the five drivers seemed to get the most attention? For me, it was growth and profit for sure. So, so why? Let's get to the why. Well, some of the things that were said. It was another strong quarter with us with adjusted EBITDA, a key profit measure, right? That's a key profit measure. It was up, so growth. Adjusted earnings per share up 13%. Not only was it important enough for them to say it, but it was important enough for them to have it as a slide. If you've been in our classes, we often talk about you can grow cash, you can grow profit, you can grow asset utilization, you can grow your financial strength. There's many metrics that you can look at. But by far, the key metrics that external analysts as well as internally we talk about are their profit metrics. So top line revenue, here's our numbers, and we're up by 0.9%. So just about 1% growth. Now, there's only two ways that can grow. They can increase by pricing, charging higher dollar amount for their products or service, and or they can do that by selling more. Uh, what they call volume, right? So they, if you went into their uh, quarterly report, they, you can find out what's going on there. Now, adjusted EBITDA, uh, if you're not familiar with that metric, you can, if you've been through our class, you, you, you may know it. If you're not, do a quick Google search. What is it? Here's what it is. Earnings before, interest on their debt, taxes, their income tax obligation, and then depreciation and amortization. Another name for earnings is profits. You can say it's their profit before they took out their interest debt on their debt, their income tax, depreciation, amortization. You don't need to memorize all that. The core thing is this is their core profit metric. This is the when they go to market and say, if you want to understand how profitable we are from our core operations, this is the metric you want to look at. Now, you'll notice it's up. You can see the dollar amount, but it's up 5.1%. So again, what two levers? Growth. And profitability. <laughs> and then earnings per share is a key profit metric. It's a foundational metric that analysts use to do predictive modeling around what's going to happen to your stock price. If you're familiar, for example, with the price to earnings ratio, earnings per share is the denominator. It's the bottom part of that calculation. It's a multiple. How many times more is the market paying in relation to how much earning you're generating per share? But anyways, it's, a, again, a profit metric. Uh now, you're also starting to weave in some cash stuff here. Look at this. Free cash flow generation of $4 billion. Also, return on capital. How? So it's not just profit, but definitely profitability. Cash is in there. Some of you saw cash. Maybe that's in the top three as I look at them. But definitely growth and profit were there for sure. What other things were said around profit? There's a myriad of stuff. I'll just highlight a few of them. I'll throw them out here for you. Broadband network and product leadership. We're growing. Uh, up 4%, fueled by, and it describes where that where's that coming from. Uh, average revenue per user increase. That's how much money per user. It, it, think about it. If I, if I got just like their Fios, right? Well, there's a certain dollar amount per user. Well, now all of a sudden I subscribe to some of their entertainment packages. I'm doing all, well, all of a sudden I'm going to do their wireless as well. I'm going to get a wireless phone through them. All those other, it's it's increasing 
I've got so many users, but how much are they buying from me? As that grows, obviously, it's going to generate more profitability for their company. People are spending more per user. Of course, Peacock, not profitable yet, but they just added 4 million paying subscribers. How many remember Peacock was for free? And we didn't like now that they're charging us. <laughs> they're not charging us a lot, but and, and now just think about how many people are going to want to watch the Super Bowl. And if the only one place I can access is streaming through Peacock and I don't have a service, they're going to pay for that, right? So anyways, um, a, a huge growth there. And it kind of communicates where they're headed. They're trying to get more positive and their profitability there from one of their assets there. Their parks business, you know, a big part of their communication was during the downturn, a lot of companies didn't invest. Well, they continue to invest in their parks. You know, think about that. When's the time to invest in parks? When your parks are shut down, of course, you got to be careful because of COVID rules. But to add new stuff, what a great way to take advantage of a downturn. It's like during the downturn, if you build out your house, finish your basement because you had a little extra time, your home more, what a great use of your time, right? Well, that that's, been, although price to update your down your basements skyrocket, wood prices, everything skyrocket because we're all doing that. But anyways, they, they build out that. So when everybody comes back, they got all these new rides, all this new stuff at their at their amusement parks. It's been incredible what they've done. They highlight that. Their studio businesses. One of the things that was interesting is they look at the most popular shows. So five box, five box office hits. The top five, they use every year they do this analysis. And I, it sounds like it's not just them. It's within the industry. On average, they have two of the top five every year. I didn't know that. I wasn't connected to that. Now, I'm not a big Super Mart. Oh, I was a Super Mart a gamer, but not a big movie fan, but that was a big one. And of course, everybody's familiar with Oppenheimer. That's been a big one. $900 million worldwide box office sales just through the third quarter. It's still generating money as it goes to streaming and other places you can get access to it. So why growth? Well, because they're growing. <laughs> why growth? Because they're talking to investors. Why profitable? Because it's not just I want to grow, but I want to grow profitably. I want to increase my margin expense. And one of their key things, so why? Why are they able to generate so much profitability, so much growth? We invested in the downturn and continue to invest. Uh, their, their capital expenditures, how much they're spending, uh, meaning taking that extra cash, you know, that $30 billion of cash they'll have by year end. How much of that goes back into reinvesting in my company? Well, as of the first nine months of this year, I want to say it was like um, $10 billion. So they'll take a third or more, uh, probably be closer to 11, 12. As I look at last year, they were at about, uh, um, in 2022, the full year, there was about $11 billion they invested back in their business. That's just capital budgeting. That's not acquisitions that they did, other things they did. But in the end, a significant reinvestment of their dollars to try and find what products, what entertainment we want as, as consumers. Well, where do they see their growth drivers in the future? Uh, right here. This is kind of where they're seeing growth. And again, I, I know them as a residential broadband, but wireless, I, where are they going to go with that? Are they going to really compete with the AT&Ts, the Verizons of the world, theme parks? It's They've got so many diversification of products, allows them to kind of withstand ups and downs. Very strong position. So what were the two or three main points? Well, here's the three that I, I brought out. Again, there's others, but these are three that stood out to me. Our steady performance has been a direct result of how we've uh, always run the company, which is with a focus on industry-leading performance, both operationally and financially in each of the business. What's that? I'm, I'm communicating to the market this confidence, research. We know what we're doing. Why? Well, I'm communicating to investors. I want to, if you're with me, here's why you need to stay with me. If you're not with me, here's why you should be with me. We know what we're doing and the numbers speak to that. It's kind of like, you know, uh, think of a, a top performing company. Well, look at our numbers. <laughs> we run it well and we perform well. That's what they're saying here. Combined with a long-term customer centric, so very focused on external customers. What is it we want? Think about the entertainment industry, how it's changed over the last, you know, if I had more time, if you're in my class, I could see everybody. I'd say, how many of you have given up? The standard cable packaging. We're all doing streaming, right? Well, now they're talking about rebundling streaming like you used to do in your cable company. But they're trying to anticipate where customers are going and what does that look like? That's the next statement. This customer-centric focus, right? Uh, approach to decision-making that ensures our, each business is positioned to win in the future. And then finally, key message was this has all been facilitated by a philosophy of investment 
in our business that has remained consistent through different economic and credit cycles, and particularly through the recent global pandemic. When, when some companies may have been, I, I didn't do enough to look at like Warner Brothers and all these other groups to see what they did, but they took as much of that cash, reinvested it, and they're really winning on the backside of that. So where do they see themselves going? Well, where, overall, here's where we see ourselves throughout the rest of this year. I expect that our focus on building businesses that are market leaders for the long term through strong execution, investment, innovation will keep us in one of the strongest positions to perform for our customers, employees, and shareholders. We're focused on investing in and driving growth and high margin businesses. So think about that. If I got low margin, I'm getting less than you know 5%, for example, I might get out of that and go for a higher margin opportunity. Uh, while protecting our profitability in businesses with secular headwinds through discipline cost management. So which leads into, so where are we going to invest? Uh, I love this. this next slide. It talks about kind of their key areas, organic growth, taking our experience, our knowledge and growing from within, strengthening their financial position. Uh, it's, a, it's a leverage metric is what they call that. Basically, if they were to take all their EBITDA and pay off all their debt, it would take them 2.4 years, which is fairly reasonable, um, and, you know, a leverage ratio. So they're in a strong financial position. And then get as much cash as I can back to my shareholders. That's what they're telling the market. And, of course, that's what you want to look at in future quarters. Well, where do the analysts come in on this? Well, you know, cost reductions, uh, uh, questions as you reduce costs, it's increasing your margins around their connectivity. What's happening there? How much of that's going to go back to reinvestment? More aggressive and wireless. Uh, Exumo, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce that. But you may. It, it, I know it's been around for a while. It's a free streaming, but now they're looking at bundling things through that, thinking of that as potential opportunity in the future. Of course, they make money off of advertisement through there. Uh, it's kind of like we just moved all of our regular TV advertisement now onto some a platform where it's being streamed, but it's the same concept. Uh, broadband growth and competition, and then this whole idea of the sports strategy. It's a significant dif differentiator, a big money win for them and the opportunity of the future. Well, folks, that's the tool. So what do I know now? They've got rapid growth, great profitability, great cash available. Well, how do they perform? Well, this is the tool that gets you to the how do they perform. This is the scoreboard tool. So it's called navigating the financials. On the left-hand side, you're going to see the, the, three, the five financials, cash, profit, assets, growth, and people. Then what are the key metrics most companies look at? Now, you don't have to be in our program. The genius of this tool is right here and right here. You don't have to be in our program and know how to read financials. It'll tell you where to go to find them. Not only that, you don't have to have, memorize all the equation. It tells you if there's any sort of calculations, how you get to them. So it's a really easy way to quickly assess how a company's performing. So let's do this together. Now, you don't have the financials in front of you. Here's what I want to do. We're going to look at about cash and cash equivalent. Get your get your chat box off so I, so I can see it. And let's just go through where do I go to find this. Let's make sure pe people are comfortable using this. And I'll walk you through just a few metrics. Then we'll show you how we use that. So as you look at this, um, cash and cash equivalent, based on my tool, put in the chat box, make sure we're comfortable using it. Where am I going to go to find this? If I want to see this metric, where do I go to find it? If I want to understand cash and cash equivalent based upon this tool, go to my tool. Here's the statement. Yes, you can go to the 10K, but if it's a quarterly, it's a 10Q. What statements it tell me to go to? Right there. The most common place is the balance sheet. Now, some of you may have a 300 level understanding of financials. You actually can fight on the cash flow, but most people are going to go to the balance sheet. Now, you don't have the balance sheet. I do. Here it is. So I'm looking for cash and cash equivalent. If you've been through our class, you'll know that it's listed as most liquid down to least liquid. Of course, most liquid is going to be cash. It already is cash. So here's the number. How much cash did they generate? Six billion four hundred. Excuse me. How much cash did they have on hand? Six billion four hundred thirty-five million. I plug it in. Okay, let's do the next one. I want to get cash flow. What statement am I going to go to to get that based on my tool? Help me out here. Just do a couple of these, and then we'll move on here. Where am I going to go to find my cash flow from operations? Use my tool. There you go. It's the cash flow statement right there. So we jump to cash flow. The, tool, the line item I'm looking at right here, net cash provided by operating activities. This is, remember, all the difference from the cash that comes in minus all the cash that goes out. How much cash is left over? $22,579,000,000. So I plug that in over here. Now, this actual number, 
I, I forget. You subtract that from where it was. I'm just doing the quarterly numbers right now. If you take the number they have as a quarter and where they were before, it's it's actually eight billion one hundred fifty three million dollars. That's how much cash they generated. Um, in fact, I think I might have that next slide. Do I have that? No, no. It looks like it's been shared. Anyways, you can get to that number that way. Well, let's do a revenue one. So if I want to do my net profit margin, I got to get two metrics. I got to get my total revenue and I got to get my net income. The statement I'm going to look at is the income statement, right? So I jump over to income statement. My total revenue on a quarterly basis is right here. $30,115,000,000. I can bring that over. Then I got to get my net income. Let's see if you can get that. It's on this statement. I want net income. What's the number? Put it in my chat box. I'm looking at the income statement, looking for the net income number towards the bottom. Also it's referred to sometimes as the bottom line. What's that number? Yeah, we got two numbers. You're right. We got two numbers. So we got this one or we got this one. You can pick either one. Uh, if you've been in our class, we'll talk about this is the portion that's specific to their investors versus their joint ventures. So in the end, this is, they actually had a loss on some of their joint ventures. So it actually increased their profitability as shareholders. You can use either one. I'm just going to use the net income one. Here it is. You plug it in. Here's my calculation. I take the 3997 divided by the 3115. I get 13.3. That's the, that's the, what does that say? For every hundred dollars a company brings into their comp, uh, every hundred dollars of revenue, they generate $13 and 30 cents of profitability. That's about one percentage point than the kind of average company. So they've got a pretty good profit margin. Well, folks, I, we have three minutes left. I don't have time to go through the whole thing. Here's what you do. You then go through and complete the rest of it. Now, you can do it on a quarterly basis, compare one quarter to another, which you see here. Or you can do it on an annual basis. Uh, 2023, 20, the first nine months versus 2022, the first nine months. You always like that comparison because you'll notice then I got huge benefits year over year in my profitability. Well, what happened to net income? Now, if you had time, you'd see that they did some write-offs on, on uh, some of their assets. It was actually on their Sky program. They had to write down some of the value of their assets coming out of COVID. So you saw an impact on their profitability. But imagine if you did this quarter over quarter, how quickly you'd see what's going on in your business. Well, you can look at it not just from a uh, uh, internal, but you can also look external. You can look at competitors or last month, for example, we did PayPal. You can look at any company just to compare. How are they doing versus other companies in different industries? Well, folks, that's the tool. So now what do I know? Well, I know they had a good year. <laughs> the first nine months of this year has been pretty strong. Great financial metrics as we look at the company as a whole. Uh, I can see where their strategy is, profitability uh, uh, and, and, and sustainability of their profitability. Well, the last part is to do something with it. And that's where we get to this apply phase. It's basically saying, okay, based upon what I've learned, what am I going to do about it? Here at Acumen Learning, everything we do is about moving the needle. You can't just come to a one course and you're done. How do I use this beyond the course? That's why we do these programs. Imagine if you did this the next two or three quarters. These are the outcomes. We had a company, uh, unbeknownst to us, one of our clients researched, what's the benefits? What was the learning and development that their employees got? Here's what they got. Improved their performance on their business and functional role. Increased their collaboration. Improved upward communication. Improved employee engagement, the thing we talked about earlier. Increased business focus and improved teamwork. Folks, that's what this does. So you got to do something with it. If you just know and you don't do anything, you've wasted our time. I've wasted your time. So the last part is how do I bring this together? And for me, what were my new insights? I did not realize the depth of what they provide, nor did I realize how strong their profitability is. They generate a significant amount of profit as well as cash in the company. And then their cutting edge is they're, they're really innovative about what the next step was. So what would I do with it? Here's the three things that I would do. Now, I'm a consultant. I'm going to take this information. I'm going to look at their competitors, see how it applies to wireless, how it applies to other telecommunications, as well as uh, connectivity companies. How do they look? How are they compete against Google Fiber, for example? I then I'm going to share that with my consultants, clients, and new customers. Boy, if you're part of Comcast, I would love to work with you. Last step of this tool is to do something. Go have a conversation. If you analyze your own company, go talk to your manager. If you looked at a customer or partner, go talk to your sales manager. If you're looking at a competitor, how can we differentiate ourselves? That's how you use these tools. So folks, as we wrap up today, I hope I've inspired you enough to say, you know what, I'm going to take a chance with this. Remember, as we talked about that preparation phase, that was to review your notes. Well, once you've done this, this becomes your notes. This is what you look at with your team members as you prepare for the next call. So here it is. 
as you think about what are you going to do with this, folks? How are you going to use this tool? Put in the chat box. Are you going to use it to look for a company you work for, a company you sell to, compete against, partner with, invest with? Or you know what, Brent? I'm going to do it for next month. Here it is. Here's the tool. Go to acumenlearning.com. We'll put that in the chat box. My team will put that in there. Click on that before you leave. Make sure you register for the next one. You're going to access to this tool, a great resource. If you're somebody saying, you know what, Brent? I want a deeper dive. We give you $100 off our online tool, which is absolutely valuable to give you the simple framework of the five drivers and how to look at the three financial statements. If you're somebody who's taking the course, you want a refresher, it's a great refresher as well. If you're somebody saying, you know what, I don't want to just do a, a, a personal thing. I want to do this with my team. Please reach out to us. If you go to our website here, you'll see ways to reach out and we'll follow up with you and uh, help build your business acting within your team. Folks, it's been my pleasure. Hopefully you'll come back. We'll look at uh, Warner Brothers here in about uh, two or three weeks. We're doing a little earlier because of the holiday season. So the 13th is when we'll look at that. Thank you for your time. Invite others. See you again. Thanks, folks. Have a great day.